Captain's Log 01092024 We have seen Captain Federico Joaquin apprehend T. Larg, Station 53's leader, who was raising a Cosmozoan plant creature thing and experimenting on it. And now it is time for the review. This is a review of Star Trek Adventures Captain's Log. Let's dive in. So here we have Captain's Log. This is the original series cover and there are about four different covers that expand through the different eras of Star Trek, which is actually really cool. Um, I really like the original series, which is why I actually picked this version up. So let's go ahead and flip it over and read what's on the back. Boldly go where no one has gone before. There's no such thing as the unknown. Only things temporarily hidden, temporarily not understood. Captain James T. Kirk. The Captain's Log solo role-playing game presents a complete standalone rule system adapted from the award-winning Star Trek Adventures role-playing game you can use to create original Star Trek stories with a dynamic character formed from your own imagination. Whether you are venturing into the cosmos alone, conducting galaxy-spanning missions cooperatively with friends, or exploring the unknown with a game master facilitating your adventures. Use the contents of this book to generate countless hours of memorable adventures. All right. Well, since this is one of the Star Trek Adventures line of books, the publisher is obviously Modivius Entertainment. Published in 2023, the 2D20 system designer is Nathan Dowdo, and the lead writer for this specific game is Michael Dismuki. Our book is broken down into, uh, well, a couple different chapters, a couple different sections. You're going to have your introduction sections, which will actually explain the Star Trek universe, which is actually really handy if you're not caught up on Star, Star Trek lore. Then you're going to have your character creation chapter, which will actually take you through the whole process. And then you're going to have your how to play section, your rules of play and actually playing it. And then at the very end of the book, you're going to have all of your uh, rollable tables and things like that, which is very handy for a game like this. So let's go ahead and talk about character creation first. I would classify character creation for a captain's log as being medium complexity. There is some bookkeeping on your end, little bonuses that you can get here and there, and you'll have to be mindful of the max number that your stats can go to. There are two ways to create a character. The first is the life path creation, where you go through each of the steps, allocating numbers to attributes and disciplines, while also detailing your character's career. The second is the creation in play. This is a simplified version of the life path creation where you do allocate numbers to stats, but everything else, the narrative bits such as values and focuses, is figured out while in play, if it should ever even come up. My first gripe with this book is the layout. Description of attributes and disciplines are in this chapter. While I can see that it makes sense to have it here, not all of the how to play information is which means you'll be flipping through this book quite a lot. If you've ever played Star Trek Adventures, then a lot of the information here will be familiar. I will say I prefer some of the descriptions for the attributes from the actual core rulebook. It just kind of flows a little bit better. There are six attributes. We have control, which defines characters who are precise, orderly, disciplined, highly coordinated, and who possess well-developed fine motor skills. We have Daring, which defines characters who are decisive and fearless. We have Fitness, which defines characters by their physical prowess, athleticism, and endurance. We have Insight, which defines characters by their instincts and their perceptiveness. We have Presence, which defines characters by their strength of personality and by their ability to draw attention and command respect. And then we have reason, which defines characters by their adherence to logic, and it demonstrates a strong tendency towards meticulous analysis, detailed planning, the gathering of evidence, and the forming and testing of theories. So a very odd assortment of attributes, if I've ever seen any. And this game is very unique in that 
for that reason. And then we have six disciplines that represent the departments aboard the Federation starship. Now this would actually make a little bit more sense, but given the fact that these are supposed to be your skills, a little bit less so, and I'm not really a big fan of them. So your six different disciplines are command, which covers leadership, negotiation, coordinating, and motivating others. We have con, which is about spacecraft and the practicalities of living and working in space. We have engineering, which is about technology. Security, which is about safety, protection, and survival. But it is mostly importantly about violence. Then we have science, which at its heart about the pursuit and application of knowledge. And then we have medicine. While a subset of science is important enough to stand on its own as a distinct discipline and field of study. Then we have focuses. A focus is a specialization that your character has in a given field. Whenever you roll and use one of your focuses, if you roll a number matching your discipline rank or lower, then you get an instant advantage or momentum. I do really like that there are a lot of examples for the different focuses here for each of the different disciplines. So that is very nice. You don't really have to think too much outside of the box to get what you really want. Values are narrative beliefs and convictions with a slight mechanical use. If you use or challenge a value, you cross it out and you can either gain momentum or get rid of a threat. So those are the different aspects that will go into creating a character. But what is the actual process? Well, the first step is to select a species. Species will actually grant plus one, two, three attributes. And there's actually a lot of them here. And they're broken down between eras. So you have the Enterprise era, the Original Series era, the Next Generation era. So quite a few number of them. And I do like how they explain what they are because I've never seen all of the episodes of Star Trek, so I have no idea what most of these are. The second step is to choose the environment your character grew up in. And there are separate lists for settings or conditions, but you can only choose one. And they, of course, grant you bonuses to your attributes, discipline, and values. Then we're going to choose your character's early outlook. And there are separate lists for upbringing, cast, or aspirations, but again, you can only choose one. Then you're going to choose an education, either Starfleet Academy or other training. Then you're going to choose your career length, which provides you with a value, depending on which one you chose, what your career length is. Then you're going to roll for two career events, and those will give you an attribute, discipline, and a focus. And then you're going to add your finishing touches. So you get plus two to an attribute, plus two to a discipline, and another value. And I do like that the list here on page 92 uh, explains all of that. And it does give you uh, the total number of attributes, total number of disciplines, and all of that. So that's a very quick and easy way to make sure that you've calculated everything right. Because again, there's a lot of bookkeeping here. You do get like attributes in just about every single one of these steps and things like that. I am pleasantly surprised by how in-depth the system goes into creating a character. There are lots of species to choose from and lots of tables to potentially roll on. I'm actually really glad that the book explains the minutia details such as assignments and ranks for those of us who aren't the biggest Star Trek fans. To me, this seems like a very miniaturized version of Traveler's character creation system, and I really like it. The hardest part for me was coming up with values that match the sources that they came from and keeping in mind how high some of my attributes are. Creating a starship is very easy. Simply choose a ship based on what area you're playing in, which will already come with the systems and departments already filled in, and then you choose a number of talents equal to your ship's scale. The hardest part for me was to come up with the registry number and also picking some talents, although the talents for the ships are mostly narrative based. You're not really using your ship a whole lot for mechanical benefits. So it kind of seems redundant that ships have taken a back seat here, but then again, it's supposed to be about your character, your captain, so to speak. So with that in mind, let's actually talk about how to play the game. 
The oddest aspect about playing the game is how much detail we determine about the episode before we even start playing. I feel that a lot of solo games are play to figure it out. Iron Sworn and Star Force are great examples of these types of games. In Captain's Log, you set up the adventure beforehand. When you're setting up a mission, the first thing you do is select a mission type. Here you'll find a variety of tables encompassing a wide range of themes or types of missions to go on. Then you're going to generate the incident and the theme and advantages and any complications that come across. The theme and incident are words that describe how the mission will turn out. Then you'll roll for more details for the encounter again and there are a variety of tables here to make the mission even more unique for you. And once you've gone through all of that, you'll start to generate NPCs and the locations for your, your mission, where your mission is going to take place. And a lot of these tables, or actually all of these tables, are in the appendices in the back of the book. So they're nice and easy just to kind of flip through and pick the tables that are relevant. As far as the gameplay loop, you'll begin by narrating until you get to a task and then you'll roll the dice. Then you're gonna determine the impact of the roll and then narrate the outcome. You'll repeat this until the mission is finished. But how are the missions actually structured? The book recommends using a three act structure with five scenes per act. Of course, as you get used to the game, you'll probably stray away from this design to keep things fresh and interesting. Scenes can be anything from a change of scenery to a task that requires a roll. A scene may or may not require a roll depending on what is happening in the narrative. Momentum makes a comeback here, albeit in a condensed format. You can only have a maximum of one momentum. You can bank it for later, but still, you only get one, so you might as well use it. Also, you can ever roll a maximum of 2d20s. You can spend momentum to re-roll one of them, but you can't spend momentum to purchase extra dice like you could in the other 2d20 games. In addition, momentum can be spent to get rid of a threat or to gain an advantage. My only problem with the latter is that if you choose to roll on the advantage table, the possibilities are quite broad and may not always fit the situation that you're in. Combat has been somewhat simplified. For physical combat, your characters and the opponents both have a number of hits or health. If you don't start with initiative, then you begin combat with one hit. You'll perform a task and if you succeed, you deal one hit to the uh, position. Fail the task and you take one hit. If you accrue more than one success, you do gain momentum, which can be spent here. Just like with all the other 2d20 games, if you roll a natural 20, you gain a complication or a threat as they call them here. Rinse and repeat until you or the opponent is defeated. Ship combat is the same, just on a bigger scale. The ship's health is based on their scale with two extra hits that are supposed to reflect critical damages to the systems. And really, that's kind of all there is to the gameplay itself. It's meant to be very light, and it's mainly used to get the narrative flowing, if that makes any sense. Having the book in an A4 size makes sense given what this book provides. However, I think that a lot of the information has been crunched together. Headings and subheadings do stand out, which is very nice because, again, it just kind of flows. It's there's just a wall of text most of the time. And the tables are very easy to read, which is also good because there are a ton of them. Something that I absolutely love is that they list the, all of the probability matrices or the tables in the index. There's even a page devoted as a quick reference with the yes, no matrix, the core game loop, and where the important tables are located. You're gonna need these references because you are going to be flipping through this book a lot, and there's only one book ribbon. One of my main criticisms with this book is how much page flipping there actually is. A lot of the flipping could have been alleviated if they had kept similar concepts closer to each other. For example, values. You get a nice explanation on values in the character creation section, but it doesn't tell you how to actually use it until the rules of play in the middle of the book. 
I think it would have served the flow of the book better if the how to play section was before the character creation and these concepts were explained then. I do like that the book opens with what Star Trek is and an explanation of its universe, especially since I've not seen most of the shows and certainly none of the newer stuff that's come out like Picard, Strange New Worlds, and Discovery. If I'm not mistaken, the artwork is taken from the other Star Trek adventure books themselves. Um, leave a comment down below if that's not the case, but I feel like I've seen some of the artwork elsewhere. I know many of the tables in the book are borrowed from other supplements, but anyways, there's just too little artwork in the book for my taste. Most of the book consists of long stretches of text and makes it a bit of a bit of a chore to read through. I'm very surprised by how much is jam-packed in this little book. There's just tons and tons and tons of information. This really does seem like a lighter version of Star Trek Adventures, but it also shows what this game really is. It's a journaling game. And this brings me to my final thoughts, whether or not this game is really going to work for you. It comes down to two questions, really. Are you a fan of Star Trek? Fairly obvious, but if you're not, then this game is not really going to work for you because a lot of the mechanics are so ingrained into Star Trek lore and things like that. The second question, and probably the most important of the two questions is, are you looking for a journaling game? If he answered no to either of these questions, then this is going to be a very hard sell, if impossible. And it'd probably be better if he just looked elsewhere. If you are a big fan of Star Trek, but you're not really looking for a journaling game, then my advice would be to take the Star Trek Adventures Core Rulebook and any supplements that you want and just use something like the Mythic Game Master Emulator for random and oracle stuff and just kind of combine the two to make a game that you want to play. A lot of the tables that are in this book have been borrowed from the other supplements, so if you actually go out and buy some of those other supplements, then you might not be losing a whole lot here. And it's really easy to implement a yes-no uh, oracle system into your game. So why do I say this? Well, a lot of this game is built around missions. You generate missions before you even start playing, and... It seems like I had, when I was playing, it seemed like I had most of the episode already detailed right from the get-go. And it didn't really matter if I had, it, it didn't seem like it, things wouldn't have changed as much whether or not I had succeeded or failed in a role. It just seemed like I was playing around the premise of what this episode was supposed to be. And that could just very well be how I approach this game, or maybe just some of the things that have happened in the game. That could totally be on me. But it seems like a lot of the systems here are, or especially like setting up the missions, is to prevent you as a player from going off the rails. It keeps things nice, strict, and focused. Again, it could just be how I approach and it might or may not be indicative of your own experience with this game. But I would definitely like to know, so leave some comments down below. In fact, that's going to do it for this video. So go ahead and leave those comments down below. And give this video a huge thumbs up to support the series. I will see you guys in the next video.